back to the Grimm Chronicles. I am Kathy Grimm, the Grimm Reader. This is going to be seven for 2022. We're in the eighth week and I'm talking about my reading since last week, which has been good, but a bit, bit scattered because of work. Uh, let's see. So speaking of work, I am actually, I'll just show up the, this is, um, we're reading the Fouquet uh, fairy tale in this small volume of fairy tales called Undine or Undine in German by um, German romantic writer Friedrich de la Motte Fouquet who lived sort of towards the end of the 18th into the 19th century and um, is most well known for sure for this novel for this fairy tale Undine it's had an immense influence on sort of um, like the, the myth of the watery woman and the mermaid. And it, as I recall, it, he wrote it before, he wrote it 1811, and then Anderson writes His Little Mermaid, 1837. So it was an um, influence on Anderson. And it's quite different though, you know, it's very interesting. I would highly recommend it if you're at all interested in the mermaid stuff. <laughs> And um, yeah, I won't go into the whole nitty gritty of the plot, but it, it suffice to say that it is different from Anderson. I mean, in a certain sense, it is more adult um, and it is highly romantic. It's a literary fairy tale and um, all kinds of plot things happen that are really kind of difficult to explain because they're sort of you know, magical or to do with perception and things like that. I'm being vague, but I guess, I guess I don't really feel like going into very great detail about it. For one thing, because I have to do that tomorrow when I teach it. And I've been sort of... One thing that's interesting about it is that there are so many illustrations of it, even on the internet. So I've been updating my slideshow to bring in pertinent um, illustrations to help the students kind of remember and then talk about certain points in the, in the story. And I had no idea about this, but it's connected to my next work that I'll talk about. Arno Schmidt was a complete fan. And the thing is, okay, so this writer, uh, Friedrich de la Motte Fouquet, he's no Goethe. <laughs> he's not, his style is interesting, and, and but it's sort of antiquated and sort of flowery. And the fact that Arno Schmidt is a big fan of him is interesting. And he wrote uh, a biography that I want to get my hands on of, of Fouquet in his uh, sort of situating him in his sort of uh, culture of his times. I think that's kind of the title of it. But I had no, I had no idea that Fouquet is one of um, Arno Schmidt's favorite authors. And one thing that's becoming very clear to me, even as I just have scratched the surface of, uh, surface of Schmidt stuff, so to speak, is how important his own personal favorites were for him in terms of writers. I mean, they are for every writer, I think, but with him, you kind of get the sense he keeps going back to these often sort of overlooked second tier uh, writers who he really, really held in high regard. Um, and I'll get into another one of them who's definitely not overlooked, but that's, but who's also kind of interesting that he would like him. Uh, in a minute, but uh, it's one of the many things I'm starting to find out about Schmidt that I find fascinating. His idea, this this idea. I mean, I'm sort of thinking about this idea that we all have our own personal canons. We all have our own group of writers that mean something to us for our own very personal reasons. And I think I like that idea. I mean, I think that's kind of interesting. And another term that has come up connection with Schmidt is solipsistic, solip, solis, solipsism, so uh, kind of giving his own thoughts and his own mind more credence than what's going on in the outside world, which I think ties into his his connections to having lived through the Second World War and, you know, all of that stuff and witnessing the, the atrocities of just German, German, the state of this, you know, what happened with Nazi, Nazi Germany definitely plays a role in his way of thinking about things in, 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 in a kind of making him more world weary and cynical and perhaps even, you know, kind of 
he takes a kind of dim view of humanity, I would say, from what I'm gathering, but I have to sort of dig deeper. So anyway, I'm already kind of getting twisted. I knew this would happen, that would get, there's so much to say and it's all kind of connected, but it's sort of difficult to, to make it clear, so I apologize. <laughs> but anyway, so we're talking about Undina, and now I've switched to the story that I finished, so this early story by Schmidt called Entumesis, uh, or How I Hate You All, which is basically a, fic uh, it's a, it's a fictionalized diary of this pupil of this famous uh, ancient Greek geographer or you know geographer and so this is a pupil of his of his who's been sent out to measure this measure distance sort of to map this area of the desert um in in ancient times and i'm sorry i'm not I, he has said it in a specific time that i could look up but i'm not going to do it right now um and so i really enjoyed it but uh, even there i'm sort of still kind of going through the, the layers of meaning and figuring it out as to what it all means and it, it definitely is worth a reread it's pretty short it's like 30 pages but i really enjoyed it and i loved the descriptions and they were sort of this is an early work so i think it's less um experimental in nature it's kind of almost quaint in some of the descriptions of the landscape so and this sounds really odd to say, but I think I kind of like descriptions of people wandering through the desert and, and groups of people wandering through the desert. I'm thinking of this, you know, of Blood Meridian, which is completely different, of course, but um, the, the idea of the expedition is kind of interesting. And specifically, I guess the, the desert stuff, too, is um, there, too. And so very short little excerpt and what happens in the diary is that he becomes more and more he basically goes mad it's, it's sort of a descent into madness and it's also a descent into mm, pay, 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 paving his own way and de, um, splitting off from the main group of people that he's with and um, a very sort of telling entry of the diary is when he is finally alone at the end um, uh, he sort of goes into this whole rhapsody of, oh, finally I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm so happy to be alone. And um, it's kind of strange. And, you, and yeah, so that's at the end. And I'm actually kind of forgetting completely what happens at the end. It, it's sort of, um, there's a, so the, the diary just ends and then there's kind of something else written by someone else to the person who had, the, the geographer who had sent them on the on this journey and I guess his second in command dies and I don't know what happens I'll have to think about what happens to this guy he probably I think he just dies too probably um yeah oops do no I'm, uh, I'll have to come back to this anyway um just looking at the end again but so i have this text and then so i was sort of looking around the internet to help me with this text and one thing one reason why i will have to come back to this so you know sorry even though it's a short story is that i found him a very good master thesis uh master arbeit a master thesis thesis from um someone who uh her name is billa felicitas billa and it's for the University of Salzburg. She wrote this master's thesis. And what it is, is a com a commenting handbook on this story and one other of the ancient Greek stories, which are part of his a, a cycle of early Schmidt stories. And it's absolutely fascinating because well, all it is, is this person has gone in and kind of uses all you know uh, different term terminologies and places and words from the from the story to then write paragraphs as to what they mean in terms of schmidt's oeuvre and i i, I noticed that one term she uses is a sort of i think it's associated with roland bart although i could be wrong and she uses the term bio bio theme biographeme biographeme be Biographie, I think, is what it is, and how um, so one sort of picture or anything can be kind of connected to your own life story and become uh, meaningful in that way. 
biography is what she calls them and they so she kind of goes through and sifts the stories for these things and so one thing we have to say about Anthemiasis is that it's completely anachronistic there's a lot of stuff in there that is it's obviously meant to be so ancient Rome was obviously meant to be and she talks about this you know this is where I'm getting this from even though I know this is on my own um is a stand-in for Nazi Germany and sort of the the bad things that go along with the totalitarian regime and um so and for example I already noticed that in the story he talked a lot about books and you know this is ancient Greece so there weren't many books back then and um even like the songs that, that that are quoted in the in the novel, and then they turn out that they're basically Nazi songs, you know. So um, I'll get back to you with more detail once I made it through the whole thing. It's you know a hundred pages long, <laughs> this extra text that I'm reading, but I really like it, and I think it's really well written. I mean, this this lady definitely deserved an A for this effort, and. Um, Actually, it's really, it's really weird. Like they were, they were describing a picture in the story and it turns out, and I was like, wait, that sounds like this picture, this romantic picture. That's actually this picture right here. That is, um, Caspar David Friedrich's, um, woman before the setting sun. And, and it turns out that that is the picture that he was describing <laughs> in the story. I'm like, okay, that's how anachronistic this thing is and how, um, yeah. So. It's, it, and she talks a lot about it being a complex network of allusions and references and oh boy oh boy was is she right and I, I find it absolutely fascinating and I want to kind of get in you know follow the complex levels of meaning and figure it all out so that brings me to another text that I have decided to pursue a writer who I never thought I would <laughs> So apparently, I did not know this. So there's a German writer that all Germans know, some of them really, really well, including my father. He loved this writer. And it's, he was a popular writer of adventure novels. And his most famous work was um, a, 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 you know, a fictional Native American called Vinitu. And so I'm talking about the German writer Karl May. And I would be, I know I, my viewers, I'm not giving you a lot of, it's not easy to respond to these long videos about esoteric stuff, but I am interested in if any of um, my viewers have ever even heard of Karl May. So K-A-R-L-M-A-Y. He wrote around the end of the 19th century in, I think, into the 20th century. He wrote a lot. He's very, very prolific. Um, and... I'd never really wanted to read him because he's sort of, he really is associated with boys, you know, adventure stories, which I just wasn't into. But now, you know, now I'm beyond all of that. And I actually am kind of interested. And his first novel is called Through the Desert. And so I downloaded for a buck, for one dollar, all of his works. So like 35,000 words of Karl May novels onto my iPad. So whenever I'm bored, whenever I don't know what to do, I'll just read Karl May. And I don't know, I'm not going to make any promises about how much I read, but I am inter interested in him as a writer. And, you know, he, there must be something to his writing that has been able to, you know, enthuse, enthuse so many generations of mainly ma ma male Germans, but probably also some women. But he's just really, really popular. And of course, there's a lot of othering. But I've already kind of scratched the surface in terms of his colonizing viewpoint, and and even that's complicated with my. So he first didn't go there. He didn't go. I don't know if he ever traveled to the Americas, but then I, I, there was a time when he did travel to to the um, Middle East, and he did kind of change his view on things. And apparently, there's a book, this the secondary work done on this, which I will look into. But Schmidt liked him and owned all his works. And there's all, there's one of these biographies in here that is um, referring to <clears throat> someone who tells fairy tales, I guess. And it's taken from Karl May, and it's in his story. So it's just one of those moments of intersection or connect, you know, things that are in his own sphere that he kind of uses for his writing <clears throat> or, or thinks of enough to put them into his stories. So that is what is intriguing to me. So I'm gonna, I'm, I've already started through the desert, it's still at the beginning, and it is very dated, and uh, so it's sort of like, from what I know, Winnetou too, so you have a stand-in European 
who was really also a stand-in for Karl May, um, and his name is sort of translated into Arabic, but it means son of the Germans, Kara ben Nem Nemzi, and his sidekick, his faithful sidekick, who's from the area, and his name is Hachi Halev Oma. <laughs> and, and the beginning starts out with Hachi really wanting to, um, uh, what, what's the word? He's proselytizing. He wants to ha have uh, Kara ben Nemzi become uh, a Muslim because he likes him and wants him not to go to the um, whatever hell is in the Quran, which is talked about in the story. And I didn't know. So now I am learning about things a little bit, even in this sort of antiquated, you know, othering type way. But, you know, and a lot of people did, and there was this fascination with the Orient, you know, and I think even Edward Said mentions Kalamai in this, so yeah, lots of stuff going on <laughs> with that, and I really feel I'm at the beginning of my journey, but it's a fun journey, and especially mainly with Schmidt, but then in a way also with people like Kalamai, um, and I do have to kind of connect it to my father a little bit. I know he was interested in Schmidt, and maybe he, because he also found out that he was, um, and I think probably what resonated with my father, who was was this kind of dystopian view of humanity based on their experiences in the war. Schmidt sort of voluntarily put um, went to, uh, after running away from the Russians, he voluntarily went over to the Brits and said, you know, I'll be, you know, I'll be a prisoner of war for you guys rather than the Russians. And so, yeah. My father, from as I gather, was a prisoner of the Russians, but I don't know much about what happened. So I think all I know is he was very young. He's barely seventeen. So, yeah, it did. It did. Um, yeah, the Second World War just figures very prominently in people's lives to this day. I mean, for for a while still, and um, you know, it goes through the generations. So that's Schmidt and Mai and Undine. So what else have I been reading? Listening to my book still, listening to uh, Stephen Erickson. Was able to get a little, a few pages of uh, Miss Macintosh in as well, so very slowly, but I finally, she finally finished a big long chapter that had been all about uh, in the minds of two passengers on the bus, and now we're out of that headspace and we're into someone else's headspace. As far as I can tell, it's the bus driver again. <laughs> So we're into that headspace. And it is proving true that even if I'm only able to read a few pages here and there because of the fact that it really is, you're just in someone's headspace, you're not really missing a lot of plot, it's okay to sort of just read a little bit here and there as, as much as I can get to. So that's going okay. I haven't given up on it. I'd like to be able to read more, but we're getting into the point of the semester where my, my issues with energy and fatigue and achiness it's just so obvious to me how it's connected to being busy and it's okay. I, 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 I don't, I'm not quite ready to retire, but it's tricky. It's tricky. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It's tricky. And I, and this is the longest stretch. I'm really, really waiting for spring break, even though I'll have to grade a lot over spring break. Cause what you do is you, you assign something so, so that you don't have to grade bigger things in, in the, semester you can break or you grade them over the break because that's how you do things when you're teaching <laughs> um so yeah so the and then the other thing that i have been able to i have been able to make progress but not that much is the letter to me it's still going strong i still really like it and it's sort of broadening out into the fact that the letter is being passed around with the family members and the complicated situation of the young fellow, 15 year old, who doesn't seem to be able to be in control of who gets the letter. He he is sort of, he doesn't have much of a voice with the with the relatives. And, um, and I don't think he's really, he doesn't really like the fact that it's being passed around. And in, in this passing around of the letter, we are finding out more about the, the relatives, the family and their relationship to um, the, passed away father because apparently his parents are still around I think the person who's passed away anyway so it's still going well sorry to be so vague about it but um yeah it's kind of a vague book <laughs> it really is it's more like the way it's written but it is really good and um yeah all of my all of my thoughts have been a little bit vague today 
<laughs> but that's just the way it goes with these interesting but complicated texts. Yeah, so yeah, onward with everything. And I'm going to leave it here for, for this week and I'll catch you next week. Thank you all for watching. I know I'm okay with there being fewer comments because I understand that someone, my, my German viewer, ha put it really well. Like it is hard to sort of formulate something of that's connected to what I'm speaking in the kind of, it's just not that easy. I'm not talking about books that a lot of people are reading, but nevertheless, I am very grateful for anything you guys want to say. <laughs> and, you know, maybe I can try and uh, do something a little bit more easier. Like, a, I don't know, not exactly a tag or maybe a tag. I don't know. We'll see. It doesn't really matter. I'm just blab blabbering right now, blathering right now. All is well, and I'll catch you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.